message today is going to be the last message in the series of uh, Is the Scripture Truly Infallible? And that's the title of the sermon today. Today we're going to talk about the, the uh, significance of prophecy in the book. This is not just a book like a natural book. It's not like going to read Moby Dick or whatever book, a novel that you get in the bookstore. This is a supernatural book, and there's supernatural words for us here today from the Scripture, from this book. So, uh, so that's what we're going to be talking about today. Is the Scripture truly infallible? And uh, we're, gonna, we're going to talk about the prophetic, look at some of the prophecies in the, written in the Torah and in the uh, prophets and in the writings that, that point to Yeshua, that, that prophesies directly about Him. Because that's what really this whole book is all about. It's about God's revelation to us from, from Genesis to Revelation. It's His redemption story, you know, starting with Abraham and going, or actually starting with uh, Adam and Eve, to be honest, and going all the way through until the book of Revelation. It's all about God bringing his children back into the family of God where it was severed. You know, the, there was a break with Adam and Eve and, uh, and mankind was kind of, was, was, was no longer part of that family. But in Messiah, Yeshua, we've been welcomed back in to the family of God. And that's what, uh, that's truly the whole redemption story is bringing, bringing the children, bringing us back into his family so we can experience his presence. Because only in his presence is fullness of joy. Only in his presence is peace. So we must walk with him day by day. Okay, so the year was, uh, this year in fact, was the 400th anniversary of the Mayflower uh, Compact. Uh, hopefully everybody's got done their history classes. You probably know about the Mayflower, but in 1620 is when the Mayflower first came to this country. Uh, which was 400 years ago. And uh, they came to Cape Cod, which is Massachusetts area. They weren't planning on going there. They were planning on going to Virginia, but they faced heavy storms within the, uh, on their way over here. It was a small ship, and they got blown off course. So they ended up land. They were supposed to land in, in uh, September, August. They ended up landing at the end of November in, in Cape Cod. And if, you know, I'm from that area. I'm about a six-hour drive from Cape Cod. Uh, where my house is, and you don't want to be there this time in December, this time of year, because it's very cold and there's a lot of ice, but that's where they ended up. You know, they faced a lot of hardship uh, because it was, uh, you know, when they came here because of the cold weather, they weren't really prepared for, for that. But uh, they, they departed persecution. It was the pilgrims, um, just a little history lesson again, the difference between the pilgrims and the Puritans. The pilgrims decided they were going to leave the Church of England, and because they left the Church of England, they were persecuted. They went to Holland. Now, the Puritans, they never left the Church of England. They tried to reform from within. So they stayed within the main body of the Church of England, tried to uh, reform from within, but, uh, but the pilgrims were the first ones that came here to America. Now, imagine if before, you know, when they landed here in America, you know, they, they came to uh, the Mayflower, and... Uh, and before they got off, because that's where they stayed when they first got here. They stayed on the boat, uh, which wasn't a very big boat. Thank you. And, uh, you know, they were jammed in there, pretty tight spaces. But um, imagine if, if William Bradford, who was the leader of this group, this is a, this is a hypothetical, okay? This did not happen. But, but, I, but I'm giving you a hypothetical here, just so we can kind of understand the significance of the prophecies in Scripture. It says, my fellow pil pilgrims, again, this is a hypothetical. Today is December 26, 1620. We are setting foot on an untamed land and possessing an uncharted world. We will settle here in the Plymouth Colony, encountering many hardships. But from these ragged beginnings, a nation will emerge, one that will become the home of the brave and the land of the free. As subject of the British monarchy, the colonial government in this new land will endure for over 100 years. But eventually our descendants will throw off England's yoke, fighting a war for independence, drafting a constitution dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. Our citizens will elect a leader, a president, and an assembly, a congress. Americans, America's boundaries will push westward, driving out those noble tribes of Native Americans who now spread their teepees in the land of the setting sun. More and more states will join the union, but eventually a conflict will arise between them over the issue of slavery. The states of the South will secede from the others, causing a great civil war that will rage long and bloody and desperate. But the Union will be preserved through the courage and tenacity of a simple lawyer named Lincoln. 
An ensuing reconstruction period will usher in a great area of industrial growth, and America will become a global power, only to be thrust into a terrible and far-flung war that will engulf all the world. Our descendants will win that war, but we will, but we will stumble into an economic depression that will leave this land on the brink of ruin. Then another war will rage. A conflagration of over 50 million will die in this war, and our posterity will be, prevail only to be using a terrifying, only by using a terrifying weapon of apocalyptic op, dimensions against the land of the rising sun. But the following their costly victory, this land will lose its moral bearing. References to God will be expunged from public domain. Sexual perversion and violence will swallow up the nation. Entertainment will become the supreme pastime, and the Christianity we have come to here to preserve will again be threatened. And again, that's a hypothetical. None of that is true. But imagine if that hypothetical were true. Imagine if William Bradford stood up on the Mayflower Compact and said all these things, direct things about what America is, what's happening in America today. Well, that's exactly what happened with Moses. But it wasn't a hypothetical, it was prophetical when Moses stood up and said, this is what's going to happen to the land of Israel. I mean, if he would have stood up there at the Mayflower Compact and said that, do you think anybody would have believed him? I don't think so. They would have said, you're crazy. You're Meshuggah if they're Jewish, <laughs> whatever. But uh, you're crazy, man. Get out, get out of here. But he didn't get up and say that. But this is, is, is about the equivalent of what Moses, when he stood up and he declared, he prophesied over the land of Israel. And, and when the other prophets even got into more detail about the things the land of Israel will do. This is what happened. Exactly what he was doing, what, what I just spoke right here. Of course, I have the value of retrospect. But Moses didn't have that because he was hearing directly from the voice of the Almighty. He was hearing directly from Yahweh himself, the courts of heaven. So, and this wasn't just 400 years ago. We're talking about 3,500 years worth of prophetic words. 3,500 years ago when Moses, Moses was living here on this earth. And he's speaking these words about us today. These prophetic words are still living today. So, so I, but let me ask you the question. Do you think this is a supernatural book or not? I, it's not just some natural book that some man wrote, wrote you know, when he was sitting, sitting down in the, threshold, or in, in the threshing floor one day. Well, I think I'll just write a book. Well, that's not it at all. This is a supernatural book. He heard from heaven and God spoke to him. The very oracles of God. And Romans chapter 3, verses 1 to 2 tells us, and what advantage has the Jew? And I think this is speaking about the oracles uh, proclaimed by Moses and the prophets. Or what value is circumcision? Much in every way. To begin with, the Jews were entrusted with the oracles of God. And that's the point I want to make. These aren't, just, these aren't just words on a page. These are the very oracles of an almighty God. So, I mean, that just tells you the importance of what God has written in his book. This is not man's book. This is God's book. The very oracles of God. You know, an oracle is a person through whom God is believed to speak. That's what that means. It means that God's speaking through man to write these words on, on a page. It's the voice of Yahweh breathed through the writers of Scripture to reveal future events, some of which have already occurred and some of which will, will, are yet to come. A lot of the words that are spoken in Scripture have already occurred, and many of them are still to come. And we can put our trust in the prophetic word, the divine revelation that came through Abraham and his offspring. The very oracles of God came through that, through that family. So the mes this message today, we're going to explore biblical prophecy as, re as it relates to the Israelites who would bring forth the Messiah, Yeshua, or Jesus Christ of Nazareth. These prophecies prove beyond a shadow of a doubt that the words that were spoken and written by the patriarchs and the prophets of old were indeed the very words of God. And I hope to prove that to you today if you didn't already believe it. You may have, probably most everybody here already believes it, but somebody may not have that, ground, that, that foundation of faith in their heart. Maybe even somebody watching on YouTube or wherever. So in seven, Acts chapter 7, 38, it says... And the angel who spoke to him at Mount Sinai, this is talking about Moses, with our fathers, he received the living oracles given to 
us. So again, God spoke to Moses. He gave the oracles to him. And now he wrote them all in a book. He was educated, probably three or four languages. And scripture says that he had all the wisdom of Egypt. He wasn't some shepherd in the... I mean, he, he was eventually, but, but the first 40 years of his life, he was learned. He was studying. He, was, he, he, he experienced all the knowledge of Egypt. So he was able to write these things down. Peter also reminds us of the divine nature of the prophecies in Scripture. In 2 Peter 1, 20-21, it says, Above all, that's, that's pretty important, above all, that's like the number one thing in your faith. Above all, this, make this a priority to understand these words, understand the Scripture is real. Above all, understand this, no prophecy comes from a person's own interpretation. These words that are written in this book aren't from some man somewhere who made something up. Above all, we need to understand that. If we're ever going to do what the Bible says, we have to understand this is a supernatural book written from the very hand of God. That's number one. That's above all. For no prophecy was ever brought forth by human will. Rather, people spoke from where? They, they heard from God. People heard from God. No prophecy was brought forth by human will. Rather, people spoke from God as they were moved by the Ruach HaKodesh, that's the Holy Spirit, the very wind of God. They're moved by the Spirit to speak these words. I like, the, I, like the, I like the wind because, you know, what does the wind do? It kind of pushes you. I mean, we had a big windstorm the other night. Did y'all get that? But uh, we had some, I mean, they, we had our trash can and stuff flying down, down, down the world. But that's, sometimes that's how the Holy Spirit blows on us. When he really wants you to get something done, you, know, you might think, yeah, I'm okay here. All of a sudden the wind comes. But sometimes it's a hurricane. Sometimes it's a gentle breeze, but, uh, but, but whatever, whenever the wind moves you, you got to go with the wind. If you're, if you're a sailor, I don't know if we have any sailors in here. We used to have the blue bonnet. It was like this yellow boat for a while, uh, but I was not very skilled in it. I think we took it down one time and uh, ripped the sails and crashed, and that was it for the blue bonnet. <laughs> but, uh, but the, uh, you know, these, these things, but you, if you're a sailor, you got to go with the wind. That's why they landed where? At Cape Cod. That's why, because they were, that's where the wind blew them. And sometimes the Holy Spirit will blow us a certain direction. And when he spoke to these men, he was blowing his words into their heart and into their minds to write these words down. And uh, prophecy, I'm going to talk about two specific prophecies because there's hundreds of prophecies in Scripture, hundreds and layers upon layers of prophecy. But there's two key prophecies that really explain to us that the word of God is true. One is about Israel, and one is about the Messiah. So today's message is going to be about the prophecies about Israel that reveal that the Scripture is truly the Word of God. And also the Scriptures about Yeshua, Jesus, and, and how He truly is the, 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 the Messiah who was to come. So we're going to look first at Israel. You know, the Torah is the first five books of the Old Testament, speaks specifically about Israel's future through Moses. He warns them against turning their hearts away from Yahweh. So in Deuteronomy chapter 29, verse 18, it tells us, Beware, lest there be among you a man or a woman or clan or tribe whose heart is turning away today from the Lord your God to go and serve the gods of those nations. Beware, lest there be among you a root bearing poisonous and bitter fruit. So he, he warned them. He said, hey guys, you know, I'm about to die here. This is kind of his last letter, his will and testament. Now, I'm about to, to die here. And, I, and he says, beware uh, not to serve the gods of the other nations, not to worship idols, lest there be among you, a, or, or, or beware of, of a bitter root, a poisonous root. Because if you start to worship things that aren't Yeshua, if you start to worship other gods, maybe uh, whatever you exalt, anything that you, an idol is just something you exalt above the knowledge of God. That's something you rely on instead of relying on him. That could be, you know, we, we generally don't have idols, literal statues set up anymore, but we certainly have our own ideals, whether it be, you know, it could be any number of things that we, we receive comfort from, but that's not the true Yahweh. You know, it could be money. It could be, you know, uh, idolizing family. It could be idolizing, you know, your own works. It could be all, there's all sorts of things that we honor above the knowledge of God. But when we don't put him first, when we, th then we're, then guess what? We're going to receive a bitter, poisonous fruit. That's what we're going to produce. We're not going to produce the fruit of the Spirit 
The fruit of the Spirit, as we know, is love, joy, peace, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. We don't want to produce poisonous fruit. We want to produce the good fruit that comes from the Spirit. Well, if you have idols in your life, things that you're exalting above the knowledge of God, you're not going to produce good fruit. You're going to produce poisonous fruit. And the, and the Israelites did just that. Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 1. He says, and when all these things come upon you. Notice he says, and when all these things come upon you. Those are words of this is going to happen. This is going to happen to you. I'm, I'm warning you not to do it, but I'm telling you prophetically right now, it is going to happen. The blessing is going to happen. You're going to receive some blessings. And unfortunately, you're going to have the curse, which I have set before you. And you call to mind among all the nations. He's, so he's telling them, you're going to be scattered among the nations. That has happened. If anybody has any doubt, the Jewish people were spread across, not just Israel as well, uh, was spread among the nations. They had no country for 2,000 years. Uh, when you're spread around the nations where the Lord your God has driven you, that's the curse. But here's the promise. You return to the Lord your God, you and your children, and obey his voice in all that I command you today with all your heart and with all your soul. Guess what the promise is? That you will return. And guess what? That has happened in our day. He prophesies precisely what will happen to Israel in the future as revealed by Yahweh. I mean, this doesn't happen by natural means. Again, you can't make this stuff up. I mean, this is real. This is really happening today. It only happens by the Spirit. How the land will be destroyed. It become desolate. That happened. Um, Mark Twain, if anybody know who that is, he, he, he wrote a memorial about uh, his trip to Israel. And when he went there, he said, oh, it's a land filled with jackals. It's desolate. There's nothing there. The whole land vomited out because of the sin. The whole land became desolate. It's not until Israel came back to reclaim it that they've rebuilt it. And it's no longer desolate anymore. The children of Israel. Jeremiah prophesied concerning Israel is even more detailed. He's talking specifically about the first time they were exiled. Uh, he, said, he told them that they would be exiled from the land for 70 years. Later on, Daniel prophesied a second banishment after the Messiah had been cut off and killed. So not only does the Bible prophesy that Israel, well, this is Judah, specifically Benjamin and some of the Levites, they were exiled from their land, from the land of Judah. And Jeremiah said, well, in 70 years you'll return. And guess what happened? 70 years after they were banished from Israel, after they were exiled in Babylon, they came back and reestablished the temple. But there's also, a, there's also a prophecy in Scripture about a second banishment, the second time they were dispersed. And again, that happened in 70 AD when the temple was destroyed and Rome came in there and wiped out the, and wiped out the temple again. Daniel chapter 9, verse 26 tells us, and after the 62 weeks, an anointed one shall be cut off. Well, who's the anointed one? The, well, that's the anoint, Christ means anointed one, just in case you didn't know. Messiah means anointed one. So he says, the anointed one, the Messiah, will be cut off. Well, of course, we know that's the crucifixion. And shall have nothing. And the people of the prince who is to come shall destroy. So this is talking about after the Messiah... You know, this, is, this is not Daniel, you know, at, during Daniel's time, they were, the exiles were already going back to, to the land of Israel. So he's talking about a time yet to come. And that, that time yet to come is after the Messiah is cut off. He said, and he did that 40 years later. It was a very short period of time after, after Yeshua ascended and resurrected. Uh, Israel was destroyed. It says, and the people of the prince who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. Well, what did Titus do? He destroyed the city, and he destroyed the sanctuary in 70 A.D. How can Daniel get that right over 400 years before that happened? Because he was hearing the very words of God. He was hearing by the Spirit. Its end shall come with a flood, and the end shall be a war. Desolations are decreed. So after the reconstruction of Jerusalem, uh, 57 sevens is 49 years Another 62 sevens is 434 years would come to pass, so about 490 years. Well, that's just right about the right time that Messiah came. That he, I mean, he had it almost down to, I mean, some people say he's got it down to the day. Um, you know, there's some arguments about that. I happen to believe he had it down to the day. 
But 490 years after Daniel prophesied this, the Messiah came, and he says this right here. He gave us the time period that he would come. He said the Messiah would be cut off. And how, how did Daniel know these things with such accuracy? Only by the power of God speaking and working through him. This is not a natural book. When you read this, it's supernatural. Something supernatural happens to you. You know, it, whatever you hear the word, I don't care if Joe Blow on the street starts preaching the word. Whoever preaches the word, it's not the preacher per se, it's the power that's in the scripture. That's what's powerful. That's what changes our life. That's what changes our hearts. It wasn't because of some personality. It's always because of one thing. There's only one thing that changes lives. That's the Word of God. Yeshua is the living Word of God. So these, these words that come at you are, are living and active. I told you about my experience with the Holy Spirit. It's like as soon as when I was filled with the Spirit, especially, the words of the Scripture just started jumping at the, out of the page at me. It's like, man, these are life-giving to me. This is the very words. This is my daily bread. I've got to have it like I need food. I need this in my life, and we do. We need his word, just even more than we do food. We might not realize it, but our spiritual man needs, needs that word in our hearts. You know, Gabriel had revealed to Daniel that Jerusalem would only be rebuilt after the Babylonian destruction. But now, the informed, uh, he informed the prophet that sometime in the future, Jerusalem and the temple would again be destroyed. And the time of destruction would not be the Babylonians, but by the people of the ruler who will come. All right. If you want to look at history, Josephus, who was a who was a historian, he was Jewish, but he's part. He was a Roman general as well. Uh, he 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 he, uh, he wrote all this stuff down about the the fall of Jerusalem in A.D. seventy. Titus Vespasianus led the Roman legions against Jerusalem, utterly destroyed both the city and the temple. Forty years or so after the crucifixion of Yeshua. And guess who else prophesied the destruction of the temple? Not only, did, not only did Daniel prophesy it, Yeshua himself prophesied the destruction of the temple. In Matthew 24, verse 2, he says, Don't you see all these? So he's, he's in the temple at this time. He's talking about the temple. If you read the whole chapter, I'm just looking at this one verse. But he's in the temple. He said, look at all this you see. Because Herod had upgraded the temple and he had done a lot of uh, renovations. He had added some spaces, some buildings. And he says, look around you. Look at all you see. Amen. I say, I tell you, everything you see right now will be gone shortly. Not even one stone will be left here on top of another. Every one will be torn down. That's Yeshua himself prophesying the fact that the temple will be destroyed. So we have a witness from the prophets. We have a witness of Yeshua himself. And Moses as well tells us that uh, you know, if they disobey his law, that they're going, they're, they're, they would be wiped out and dispersed, and that happened. The dispersion of the Jews after the destruction of the second temple was also prophesied in Isaiah. So here we have another witness. Actually, Daniel would be the writings. But Isaiah 11, 11, he says, it, all, it will also come about in that day that my Lord will again redeem a second time, right? The first time around, he brought him back after 70 years. He says, a second time. He'll bring him back with his hand, the remnant of his people who remain from Assyria, from Egypt, from Pathros, from Cush, which is uh, Africa, Elam, Shinar, which is you know, way west, Hamath, and from the islands of the sea. Does that sound like the first, does that sound like the first, uh, the first time they were, they were exiled? Where were they in the first time they were exiled? They were all in Judah. They were exiled to Babylon. But here, he says he's going to bring them back from all the nations of the earth, and he's going to bring them back to their land. Even from the islands of the sea, he will lift up a banner for the nations and assemble the dispersed of Israel and gather, and, and gather the scattered of Judah from all the four corners of the earth. Judah was not in the four corners of the earth the first time around. So this is talking about the second time they came back. So again, is this not a prophetic book? Is that pretty clear to everybody? Does anybody disagree <laughs> that this is talking about the second temple? I mean, this doesn't happen in a regular book. This happens in a supernatural book written by the very hand of God. The first restoration. So these prophecies, it happened just as Isaiah predicted. And we know that they came in 587 B.C. and we know that they returned um, 
1948. That's prophecy fulfilled. I don't care what anybody says. That Israel coming back to the land never happened before in history. That just doesn't happen. There's been no nation that's lost their country and, the, and they were brought back and they, they made their country again. Never happened in history. And these are only a few prophecies about the nation of Israel. But, here, but uh, I'm just going to give you a summary of a few of them. It says the Jews would possess the land of Canaan and consider it their promised land. And that was prophesied by, to Abraham in Genesis chapter 17, verse 8. He says, I will give to you and to your seed after you the land where you are an outsider, the whole land of Canaan, as an everlasting possession. When God makes a promise, you can believe that it's true. His promises never change. He promised Israel an everlasting possession. So what do we have today? We have the land of Israel again. It's prophesied that they would disobey God's law. As a result, they'd be driven from the land. Deuteronomy chapter 28, verse 64 says, Adonai, Yahweh, will scatter you among all the peoples from the one end of the earth to the other. And there you will serve other gods, wood and stone, that you and your fathers have not known. So he tells them they'll be scattered. They'll be driven from the land of Israel. They would return later, the land 70 years. We already sh shared that verse. 70 years later, they would return. For thus says Adonai in Jeremiah 29, 10, after 70 years for Babylon are complete, I will visit you and I will fulfill my good word toward you to bring you back to this place. I mean, how much clearer can you get? He says, you know, 70 years. After 70 years, you're coming back. How does Jeremiah know these things? He knows it by the will and by the prophetic word of God. A Messiah would come to them. He would be cut off in Daniel 9, 26. They'd be driven from the land. They'd be dispersed to the four corners of the earth. We just read that in Isaiah 11. And amazingly, after many years, they would return a second time and possess the promised land. Jews would come from all the far corners of the globe to repopulate Israel. And I don't know if you know this, has anybody, a few people have been to Israel, but I mean, people have come from all over. They've been regathered, there's been an ingathering from all over the world to come back to the land of Israel. You know, if, if William Bradford had stood on the deck of the Mayflower and made such a precise list of predictions, I just don't think anybody would ever listen to him. Nobody has any precise list of predictions about America like that. That's pretty clear. Yet we can see how perfectly every detail of biblical prophecy is being fulfilled. There's not one word. That's why Yeshua said, that's why he said, he said, not one jot, not one tittle. Well, until, until what? Until all these words are fulfilled. And they're still being fulfilled today. The return of Israel is unique in all the world history. Never before has an ancient people, after 2,000 years of exile, basically without a country of non-existence, of being dispersed and intermingled in all the nations of the earth, return to their ancient homeland and reestablish their nation. And not only did they reestablish their nation, you know what else has been reestablished? Their language. I mean, imagine Latin coming back today. I mean, Latin's been dead for many, many years. You know, ancient Greeks, Greek, Greek. Uh, from the classical Greek has been gone for years. I don't think it's ever coming back. But this language that's been dead for over 2,000 years came back. And guess what they're speaking in Israel today? They're not speaking, I mean, they, I'm sure they speak five or six languages, but the main language they learn in school is Hebrew. That's a miracle. This language that was dead for 2,000 years and now has been resurrected. That doesn't happen by natural authority. That happens only by God's authority. Dr. William, I mean, look at the other people in, in, in the scripture. Have you ever heard of the Hittites? Where are the Hittites today? Where are the Jebusites today? Where are the Canaanites today? Where is the Edomites today? They're all gone. I mean, we don't know where they're at. I mean, to, they're, they've been scattered among the nations, and they, and, and they don't even know who they are. They probably don't, they have no idea. Hey, I was a descendant of Esau. Or I was a descendant. In fact, the Hittite dynasty, most historians said this, this was never even a group. You know, they, they, were, they, they were buried down so deep that all the, all the archaeologists said, hey, these people don't exist until they found it, buried way down deep. They found, they found remnants in, in, in the tablets that mentioned the Hittites. But, uh, but nobody knew. All the archaeologists said, no, this couldn't happen. The Bible can't be true because there can't be a people called the Hittites. Well, archaeology mostly always 
I mean, the more archaeology we get, the more we learn, it always confirms the Scripture, every time. And uh, the more archaeology, the more people discover, the more that, that Scripture is confirmed. And uh, I don't have time to go into all that, but we could preach a whole sermon on all the things that's been recently discovered that, uh, that reveals the validity and the, the authority and the authenticity of the Scripture that we have today. And that's the difference between a myth and Scripture. I think I mentioned this before, but uh, you know, a myth is not based on historical fact. It's just based on somebody's imagination. The Bible is firmly rooted in history. It's firmly rooted there. It came out of historic people who really existed, not just these mytholo- mythological creatures. That's the difference between myth and true faith. Dr. William E. Albright, who was for many years a professor of Semitic languages at John Hopkins University and the foremost archaeologist of, of modern times, said this. He said, no other phenomenon in history is quite so extraordinary as the unique event represented by the restoration of Israel. At no other time in world history has a people been destroyed, then come back after a lapse of time and established itself. It is utterly out of the question to seek a parallel to the recurrence of Israel's restoration after 2,500 years of further history. So even the archaeologist, I don't even know if he's a believer and I don't think he is, maybe I don't think he is, but, but even he recognizes this is unparalleled. There's nothing like it. I, I don't know how this happened. And he's not even a true believer in Yeshua or, 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 or in the Bible. You know, Frederick the Great of Prussia, you know, Prussia was an empire late 1600s to, to 1800s uh, in Eastern, Eastern Europe. He asked his court chaplain, he says, prove to me the existence of God. You know what the, you know what the chaplain did? He didn't say a word. Because Prussia, there's a lot of Jews there. All he did was point to a Jew. He says, prove to me the existence of God. And he pointed to the Jew. And, 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 the, and the Prince Frederick was, was silent. He says, look at the history. Look how they've developed. They've maintained their livelihood for all these years. Look at the promises made to them. So if anybody asks you, prove to me the existence of God. Just point to a Jew. <laughs> That's a miracle. It's a miracle that they still survive today. That's why it's, it's just amazing. Biblical prophecy is being fulfilled before our very eyes. So that's, those are some prophecies about Israel. Now I want to get into some messianic prophecies. Yeshua walked with his disciples. I want to start with this. In uh, Luke 24, 32. Luke 24, 32 tells us. They said to one another. This is after Yeshua was explaining, opening their hearts to the scripture. They said to one another, Did not our hearts burn within us? while he was speaking with us on the road, while he was explaining the scriptures to us. You know, I like this passage. One thing that I really like about this, you know, Yeshua didn't immediately reveal himself. You know, he could have come and he could have lit up the sky and shot a bunch of fireworks off and this would have been an awesome experience for these disciples, but he didn't. They didn't even know who he was. He was walking beside them, but, he was, but, he was, but it was hidden. It wasn't immediately revealed to him that he was Yeshua. But he, he, and, I, and I asked the question, why, why didn't he just show himself right away? Why did he have to walk with them on the road and, and, and open up the scriptures to them? Well, why is this? And that's because I believe this is, applies to us today as well. That's because he wanted them to have a firm foundation in scripture. Amen. He didn't want them just to live by their experiences with God. You can't do that. I've seen people just live by experience. And guess what? When the emotional high starts going down, guess where they're at? They're right back to the world. That's why Yeshua, people say, why doesn't Yeshua just come in here and just, you know, show himself like this, do a big magic show or whatever? That's because that's, that's not who he is. And because the, the way he reveals himself is fair. The most primary way he reveals himself is through the scriptures. And that's how he did it with the disciples too. That's why we don't always see him. We say, well, where are you, God? Well, well, guess what you need to start doing? Start going to the scriptures. He's right there. He's revealed himself there in the scriptures. And that's what he did to the disciples. He was walking. Of course, they, they sensed that there was something different about this guy. And you'll sense that too, because that's how Yeshua works. He'll come up beside you, and you'll start reading something. And you'll be like, wow, something happened in my spirit. There's something amazing about this scripture that I just read. Because he's walking there beside you. Just because you can't see him doesn't mean he's not there. By reason revealed through his Holy Spirit. So you'll be going around another verse. Wow, 
the Holy Spirit, something burned inside of me. Well, that's Yeshua walking beside you through the power of his Holy Spirit. So we need a biblical firm foundation about the prophetic words concerning his birth, life, death, burial, resurrection, and ascension. If his disciples needed that, how much more do we need that? We didn't see him in the flesh. I don't think anybody here has seen him in the flesh. But if they needed to have that scriptural foundation about who he was, how much more do we need that scriptural foundation of who he is? He works that way to us as well. Our author- the authority does, no, does not come from our experiences. Authority comes from scripture and the word of God alone. Our, our experiences can deceive us. But God's word never deceives us. His word is always true. And it never will. Your spiritual house cannot be built solely on on religious experiences or or, or different things like that. It's got to be built on the word of God. If it's not, then you're on shifty sand. And that's why he opened the scriptures to the apostles. And he'll do the same thing for you. You may be crying out to him, Lord, 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 please help me in this situation. He'll say, get to the word. Hear the word. Pray to God. You know, first you pray to him, and then you get to the word. Be anxious for nothing, he says. But how many things? And everything by prayer and supplication. I believe the supplication part is getting into the word. Find the answer to your problem. By prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. I mean, just because you might not have it all figured out right away doesn't mean you can't stop thanking him. With thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. And then what happens? The peace of God which doesn't make sense, doesn't make sense to the world, might not make sense to you, but it makes sense to him. The peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, which doesn't make sense, will guard your heart and guard your mind. That's a promise, and that's a promise we can lean on. But prayer and petition, that's how we get there. Prayer and supplication, getting in the word and praying to him. So Yeshua fits perfectly into the prophecy. Nobody else ever has, ever will, or, or is today. Luke 24, 44 tells us. Then he said to them, These are my words, which I spoke to you while I was with you. Everything written concerning me in the Torah of Moses, in the prophets, and in the Psalms must be fulfilled. Well, he's talking about the the breakdown of the Tanakh. Of course, the the Tanakh consists of the Torah, the prophets, and the writings. And they are... Back then, they would call the writings the Psalms. So he says, all these things, you know, they're going to be fulfilled. And we can see in the scriptures how these things are fulfilled. You know, I had the opportunity in October. I was out on the range with the helicopters. Uh, They were shooting their 30 millimeter rounds. And, uh, but we had the M1 Abrams tanks, which are pretty cool. But uh, I got the opportunity to ride in one. And uh, they typically have a four-man crew, so they have three riding in the belly of the tank. One is the tank commander, they have one that's the gunner, and they have one that's the loader that loads the, loads the, 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 the ammunition in the, in the tank. Well, the other one is the driver. Now, the driver sits totally separate from everybody else. He sits underneath the cannon, you know, the cannon where the tank is. So I tried to get in the driver's seat. And you can see this picture. Oh, they got it up there. Okay. So that's me trying to get in the driver's seat of the tank. Now, if I was in the driver's seat, guess where I would be? You wouldn't be able to see my head, but I was crammed up, my knees were, I could, I tried as I might to get in the driver's seat, but the seat could not, I couldn't fit. I couldn't get in there. That's as far as I could go. My head was still popping up under the cannon, and I did my best, but I could not fit in the seat. Well, Yeshua, the scripture made a seat for Yeshua. That's what the prophetic words do. And there's only one that can fit in that seat. And that is Yeshua, Jesus, our Messiah. Nobody else. I couldn't fit in that seat. I'd be stuck like this guy underneath the, underneath the cannon. We can't do it. Nobody else has ever been able to fit in that seat, the Messiah seat, which is made by the prophetic words of Messiah. The Torah, the prophets, the writings describe that seat. He fulfilled more than 300, imagine that, 300 prophecies about himself from the Tanakh, from the Old Testament. By hiding his real identity and directing us to the scripture, 
Yeshua pointed us to the overwhelming body of evidence. This testifies about me. You've been reading about me the whole time. You didn't even know it, half of you, about all the fulfillments of messianic prophecy. The rock that we stand on is revealed in Scripture. The Jewish people were very, and we're talking about, I want to go through a couple things regarding Yeshua, his birth, death, and resurrection. Uh, the Jewish people were very meticulous in keeping up with genealogies. I mean, everybody knew that. That's just one of the things they did. Uh, they kept up with their father, their fathers, uh, so on and so forth. You know, if you talk to people who've been in the, in the uh, you know, who, who can really trace their descendants back, you know, they'll, they'll tell you, they, they can usually tell you a good deal about their history still today. But, uh, but in Jeremiah chapter 23, verse 5, it says, Behold, the days are coming. It is a declaration of Yahweh Adonai, when I will raise up for David's righteous branch, and he will reign as, reign as king and execute justice and righteousness in the land. Okay, so did anybody ever argue that, that Yeshua was a son of David? Do you, hear, do you see that anywhere in Scripture? No, because they, they, they knew it. They had the records. So yes, Joseph ben David, he is a son of David. And Mary was actually, they're both, mother and father, by the way. Luke records the mother's genealogy. Matthew records the father's uh, Joseph genealogy. But both ways, he was still a descendant of David, according to the flesh. And again, that was a prophecy right here in Jeremiah 23, 5. He says, the days are coming. It's a declaration. I'll raise up for David a righteous branch. Well, who's that righteous branch? It's pretty clear to me that that's Yeshua. And he will reign as king, execute justice and righteousness in the land. We see this fulfilled. I don't, I don't see anyone disputing these facts. Uh, you know, Joseph was still going to Bethlehem during Roman times. Why did he go to Bethlehem? For the tax, for the census. He had to go there because he was a descendant of David. That's why they went to Bethlehem. So there's no debate about it. Even the Romans knew, hey, this is a descendant of David. So the Messiah would not only be born in David's family, but would also be born in David's city. Micah 5.1 tells us, But you, Bethlehem, Ephrathah, least among the clans of Judah, you will come out to me, one to be ruler of Israel, one whose goings forth are from of old and from days of eternity. You know, this, was, this is Micah, this is the prophets, you know, this is way after David. So he's prophesying for it, from Bethlehem would come the Messiah in Micah 5.1. So he prophesied, this is the city that he will be born, in Bethlehem. How can that, how, how could he get the right city? Because he heard from God. He heard from the Spirit. Yeshua came from the line of David. He was born in Bethlehem, per, per, uh, confirming the prophecies. He's the only one who fits in that seat. Has there been anybody else who, fat, who sat in that seat? No, nobody else has been able to sit in that seat but one, Yeshua. He also fulfilled the pro Isaiah's prophecy in Isaiah 7.14. We're talking about his birth right now. Therefore, Adonai himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin will conceive when she is giving birth to a son. She will call his name Emmanuel. So here we have two prophecies about the Messiah. One is that he would come from a virgin. And number two is that he would be called Emmanuel. God himself would come dwell with us. That's what Emmanuel means, God with us. The, he prophesies the virgin birth and the nature of Messiah. He'd be preceded by Elijah in Malachi 5, 4, 5. He says, Behold, I will send you Elijah, the prophet, before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. And of course, we know that this person was fulfilled in John the Baptist. And, uh, you know, that doesn't, but just because... You know, some people have had tried to use these things, these signs in the sky, to say that, uh, you know, Yeshua is returning and different things like that. But I don't subscribe to that at all. I'm just telling you that. Nobody knows. First Thessalonians 5.2 says, For you yourself are fully aware. So he's telling the Thessalonians here, You are fully aware, you guys know this completely, that the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. Well, what does that tell us? That if a thief in the night is someone, we don't know when the thief is going to come. If we knew, he wouldn't be a thief. He'd probably be, I mean, if, he lived, if, we, if he's from Texas, he'd probably be dead. 
you know, if he's, uh, if he's from some other country, we'd call the police to, or some other state, you know, to, we'd call him to come in, in there and stop the thief. A thief we don't know when they're coming. Matthew 24 says, For as lightning come, 24, 27, For as lightning comes from the east and shines as far as the west, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. So these are prophecies. What do we know about lightning? Yeah, we can see the storm, and there may be lightning, but do we, see, do we know where the lightning's going to strike? Does anybody know when the lightning's going to strike? I can tell you a lot of people have been hit by lightning. Some guy's been hit like 90 times. He probably would really like to know when the lightning's going to strike, <laughs> where it's going to strike. Uh, just follow him around. Maybe you'll get to, <laughs> maybe you'll know. But he says it's going to be like lightning, his return. And in, in 24, verse 44, it says, Therefore, this is the whole point that Yeshua is making. Therefore, you must be ready. In other words, it's coming as a thief in the night. Get your oil lamps topped off. Because he's going to come like a thief in the night, an hour you do not expect. That's what scripture says. For the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. So, I mean, that's pretty clear to me. That's not even the main scripture everybody uses. Even the sun, even the sun doesn't know the day or the hour. So if somebody tells you they know the day, they know the hour, they're pumping you full of something that's not from the Lord. I'm just telling you that. But the, here's the point that Yeshua is making. Get ready. Get ready. Get ready. Get your flask full of oil because he's coming when you don't expect him. He'll be here. So get ready for his coming. You know, many end time prophecies are cryptic, and I think deliberately so. That's why his disciples didn't recognize the Messiah's appearing. Cryptic, uh, so you can see, you know, Scripture says we see through a glass dimly, but we, one day we'll see him face to face. Now, I personally believe that the reason it's cryptic is so the forces of darkness don't know the day or, or don't know. Uh, like, like, do you think the devil would have put Jesus on the cross? If, they would, if he would have known what, what, that that would result in the, in the salvation of mankind? I certainly don't think so. I think that a lot of the prophecies are cryptic for that very reason, to hide from the forces of darkness exactly, because they don't have any divine revelation. They know the scripture. Obviously, we've seen the temptations of Yeshua. The devil knew the scripture, but he doesn't have the prophetic insight. And that's why these things are hidden. And that's what I believe. You know, I often get emails to uh, counsel people, and uh, these emails are always encrypted. Uh, they just, all it contains is the name of the person. The rest of it, I can't see it unless I get the code to open up the, open up the deal and see what's going on with this person. Well, Yeshua has the key to decode the encrypted email. So he was the one who, who fit the, all these prophecies. Now, these rabbis were speculative, oh, this, 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 and this is going to happen, and all these uh, scribes. But they didn't have the key. And the key to unveiling the prophecy, Yeshua is the spirit of prophecy. That's what the scripture says. Yeshua is that cryptic code, so you get to see the whole picture in him. So if you want to know prophecy, get to know him. Get to know his word. Even his dis closest disciples, they were told over and over again, you know, he has to die, he has to be buried, he has to raise again. But man, when, when, when it happened, what did they all do? They all scattered and they all ran. In, in what? In fulfillment of prophecy, by the way. That's a prophecy that his, his, his disciples would be scattered. So uh, if they were around him, you know, 24-7 basically for all these years, at least about three years, you know, you'd think they would have got it. But they didn't. If they didn't get it, you know, we, we truly need to understand that he's the one who unlocks the key, but we got to listen to him. They weren't really listening. If you listen to what he's telling you, these things can be revealed. But uh, anyway, that's just the side. So I'm going to go through just a number of prophecies here about the Messiah. It was prophesied the Messiah would fulfill three different offices. That is the, uh, th that is the, the prophet, the priest, and the king. So he's a prophet, priest, and king, king. Uh, uh, who, the only one who ever fulfilled those three roles was Melchizedek in Scripture. And of course, it said that you're a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek in Hebrews. So he, he fulfills those three roles, priest, prophet, and king. Uh, the, the boy Yeshua, he was, it says that zeal for your house will conceal me. Well, where was he at when he was 12 years old? Well, he wanted to be in the house of God. That's where his favorite place to be was. I want to be in your house. Okay, Isaiah 61 says that he was anointed to preach the good news and to do what? Set the captive free. That was another prophecy about 
Yeshua. Isaiah 9 1 tells us that his ministry would begin in Galilee. Now you'd think that the, pro, that the Messiah, the ministry would begin in Jerusalem. That's what everybody would assume. But that, what the scripture says in Isaiah 9 1, in Galilee of the nations. That's where, that's where the, the ministry would be. And that's where the bulk of Yeshua's ministry was, right around the Galilee, in Capernaum and Nazareth, and all these cities where he did all these miracles. Zechariah 9 9 prophesies that the Messiah king will come to Jerusalem. So his ministry will be fulfilled there. So he finishes in Jerusalem and it prophesies that in Zechariah 9 9. Isaiah 35 5 to 6 foretells the miraculous nature of his ministry. In, in Isaiah 35 5 and 6, it says, Then the eyes of the blind shall be open, and the ears of the deaf unstopped. Then shall the lame man leap like a deer, and the tongue of the mute sing for joy. For waters break forth in the wilderness, and streams in the deserts. Well, that sounds a whole lot like me to the ministry of Yeshua. That was the things that he did. He, he did miracles. The blind see, the lame walk. And that's what he said to those guys when they said, he says, well, are you the Messiah? He says, and he tell, go back and tell John the Baptist, the lame walk, the blind see. Why was that so important? Because he would have looked back and said, well, that's right in Isaiah 35, 5, and 6, prophesying the Messiah. Its foundation is in the word. It is also prophesied that he would speak in parables. Psalm 78, verse 2 says, I will open up my mouth in a parable, and I will utter dark sayings from of old. So he, he fulfilled that. It's also prophesied in Isaiah 53 and Psalm 118, 2, that he would be rejected by his own. Psalm 118, verse 2 tells us, Let Israel say, His steadfast whoop, love endures forever. Sorry, that's the wrong verse. But anyway, after, it might be the next verse. But anyway, we'll forget it. But he was re rejected by man. It is prophesied in Psalm 41, 9, the Messiah would be betrayed by a close friend and also that he'd be, he'd be betrayed for 30 pieces of silver. Zechariah 11, verse 12 says, Then I said to them, If it seems good to you to give me my wages, but if not, keep them. And they weighed out as my wages 30 pieces of silver. Now this is a direct prophecy to Judas Iscariot, who would betray Yeshua for 30 pieces of silver. It was prophesied that he would die. Zechariah 13, 7 says, Awake, O sword, against my shepherd, against the man who stands next to me, declares the Lord. Strike the shepherd, and the sheep will be scattered. I will turn my hand against the little ones. So, strike the shepherd. They struck the shepherd. The shepherd's the Messiah. The shepherd is always imagery of Messiah. And the sheep were scattered. The disciples, in fact. Psalm 35, 11 prophesies false witnesses will rise against him. Psalm 22 gives a graphic description of his crucifixion. I'll read a few of those verses. Psalm 22, 1. It says, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me from the words of my groaning? Well, what did Yeshua say when he was hanging on the cross? He says, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Those were a direct quote from Psalm 22, 1. Psalm 22, 7, verse 8. All who see me mock me. They make mouths at me. They wag their heads. He trusts in the Lord. Let him deliver him. Let him rescue him, for he delights in him. And what's this prophesying? This is prophesying the soldiers, remember? When the soldiers were, when he was hanging on the, when he was hanging on the cross, they said, well, you know, if, if he truly is Elijah, you know, let, let him come down. So that's, that's, that's fulfillment of that prophecy. In Psalms 22, 12, and 13, it says, many bulls encompass me, Strong bowls of Bashan surround me. They open wide their mouths at me like a ravening and roaring lion. Okay, so if you know anything about the bowls of Bashan, that's talking about supernatural. The demons are attacking. That, that's where, I mean, I'm just talking about imagery from Scripture. Bashan is always associated with the, with the demonic. So the demonic forces are shutting their mouths and mocking roaring like a ravenous lion. Psalm 22, verse 14 and 18. It says, I am poured out like water. All my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It is melted within my breast. My strength is dried up like a pot's herd, and my tongue sticks to my jaws. You lay in me in the dust of death. Dogs encompass me. A company of evildoers encircles me. They have pierced my hands and my feet. Now, this is over a thousand years before Yeshua even came. 
How would they know that his hands and his feet were going to be pierced? I can count on my bones. He didn't break a bone. They stare and gloat over me. They divide my garments among them. How would anybody, how would the psalmist David would have known these things? That they would divide his clothes and cast lots for them. Well, they did. Well, he did by the Spirit. So this description, this is a vivid description of the crucifixion. I don't, think, I don't see how anybody could deny that Psalm 22 is not describing the crucifixion of our Messiah. Isaiah 53 goes on to tell us the purpose of his suffering. Isaiah 53, 4 tells us, Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we, he is, we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed or bruised for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds, we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one of us to his own way. And the Lord laid on him the iniquity of us all. That's the purpose of the crucifixion. He tells us that the nails were for our transgressions. Those nails had a purpose. That was our punishment. What do we deserve? We deserve the nails for our sins, for our transgressions. So every time we think about sinning, we should remember the price that was paid to redeem you for your sin, the cost. Hands and his feet were pierced. He was crushed or bruised for our iniquities. Well, that's, what, what that, what's that talking about? Well, you get bruised when somebody beats you, right? They beat you, so they beat him. They punched him, they whipped him. He was bruised for our iniquities. The beatings he received for the perversity of our sinful nature. That's the, the, our, the man's natural bent towards sin. Like I said, you don't have to tell a toddler to do evil, right? You've got to train him to do right. So we have a natural bent toward evil. But he was bruised to, to make it straight. He was bruised, he was punched, he was beaten. So that, so that our iniquities, so the bent could come back the way it was supposed to. And again, we deserve those beatings. But he took them for us. He took for our sins, he was pierced. For our iniquities, for the bent human nature, he was bruised and he was beaten. For, for the, so, I'm about to come to a close here. But he brought us the peace with God, and that's always been the goal. The goal has always been peace with God, right relationship with God. The whole Bible is about man and God, woman and God, all interacting and being in fellowship with each other. That's, that's the ultimate goal, because we see in Revelation 21, it says that in his kingdom, there's no more crying. I mean, all the other stuff is secondary. When you're in his presence, it's fullness of joy. In his presence, no more crying, no more sighing, no more dying, and no more pain. So these are just some of the prophecies about Yeshua given hundreds of years before his birth. Professor Stoner, who was chairman of science, mathematics, astronomy at several universities, selected eight of the many predictions of scripture relating to Yeshua's life, ministry, and he formulated a mathematical probability of their coming true. Just eight, just eight prophecies, mind you. Uh, he would be born, and these are the eight that he selected. He said, you'll be born in Bethlehem, preceded by a forerunner, enter Jerusalem as a king riding a donkey, be betrayed by his friend for 30 pieces of silver, be placed on trial, uh, uh, and though innocent, make no defense of himself and be crucified. Those are eight prophecies. Now he said the, the likelihood of just eight prophecies and again, he did the math. I'm not a mathematician, but he did the math. He says the, likely, the, the likeliness of eight of those prophecies all coming to be was one in 10 to the 17th power. That's not 1,700, 10 to the 17th power. That's over 17 zeros. So that's a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of millions, a lot of billions, a lot of trillions, in fact. <laughs> what kind of chance is that? So if you cover the state of Texas with silver dollars, to a depth of two, two feet, right? And then you pick out one. How many people could do that? That's the likelihood of just eight prophecies being fulfilled. This is a supernatural work. But there's not just eight prophecies. There's 300, at least, predictions of Yeshua. So this is my question I'll leave you with. Do you think that the scripture is man's book? Do you think it was created by, written by man? Or do you think it was written by the hand of the Holy Spirit? Pearson also noted, no miracle which he wrought so unmistakably set on him the seal of God as the convergence of a thousand lines of prophecy in him. 
as in one burning focal point of dazzling glory, every sacrifice lit from Abel's altar until the Passover of Passion Week pointed us as with the flaming fingers of Calvary's cross. Everything points to him. Even Job number 19 verse 25 tells us, for I know, even he knew where his help came from, for I know that my Redeemer lives, and in the end he will stand upon the earth. How did Job know this? By the Spirit. He knew it by the Spirit. And he does live indeed, and indeed he will stand on the earth. He is the only one who could possibly fit in that chair. Nobody else could ever fit there. Built by all the prophecies, revealed in the scripture, in the Torah, the Tanakh, the Torah, the prophets, and the writings, revealed about him. Nobody else could have ever fulfilled those things. And yet God did it. I believe this is probably the strongest proof of scripture. It's the prophetic words fulfilled. That's what tells me it's a supernatural book. There's a hand of divine providence working in and within Scripture. If we can read in it, meditate on it day and night, it will produce much fruit. Because we trust his word, we can trust him. You know, if we don't trust his word, we can't trust him. Hopefully this will help you if you're struggling at all with Scripture. Um, You know, the more you trust his word, the more you can trust him. Does that make sense? Because we trust him. Our goal is to know him. You know, Paul, prophesied, Paul said, my goal is to know him in the fellowship of his suffering and the glory of his resurrection, the power of his resurrection. When we, know, when we get to know him, guess what else happens? We get to know ourselves. We start to understand our part. We all have a part in the divine plan. Every single person has a part in his divine plan. If we can know him through the word of God that points to him, then we'll understand our part in his divine plan as well. And we understand that, we truly discover who we are in him. And we want to know that if we don't know who we are in him, if we don't know our identity in Messiah, then we're never going to be able to do anything significant for him. You know, everything we do is going to be wood, hay, and stubble because we're, we're working on it based on idols. So we need to work on him. And, we, and that's our segue, really, to the next series. This is the end of this series on um, the infallibility of Scripture. And... Uh, but that's the foundation stones. We have to have that foundation. Everything that we do, every, all of our actions, everything we say should be built on the word of God. And when we are built on the word of God, we will have found, we won't have anybody, we don't have to tell, nobody has to tell us that we're this group or that group or this group or that. So you can just say, I'm a, I'm a Messiah. I'm a, I'm a follower of, of Jesus. And guess what? That's, that's your identity. And for the next three or four weeks after this, we will, we will segue into discovering our identity in Messiah. When we can truly d- discover that, that's how the captive is set free. That's what this whole year is about, setting the captive free. And in order to do that, first, the very first step is knowing his word and believing his word and discovering your part in his divine plan. So for the next four weeks, we'll be talking about that. But uh, that concludes this series. So hope-